The Articles of Confederation were essentially the United States of America's first constitution. The idea is that we needed a document that at least could get us through the war. What we had at the end of the Declaration of Independence were 13 individual colonies, 13 individual now states. They had to fit themselves together in some way in order to move forward. The biggest issue with the Articles of Confederation was the inability to raise funds. It simply couldn't be a respectable government unless it had its own revenue source and could do things with it, have an army, have a navy. Uh, the tax provisions under the Articles required that all 13 states agree to every tax individually, each state legislature. That never happened. Indeed, each state cast its own vote in Congress. Individual congressmen didn't have votes. You only voted as a state. So as a result, the articles proved very ineffective. And only by begging from the states were they able to get money. Many states didn't send much money. Few states didn't send any money. There was an executive who really didn't show up for office. There was a, a legislature that was a unicameral legislature, one house, uh, that required uh, unanimity to get anything done. And for a national judiciary, there was none. So if there were disputes uh, between the central government and the states, uh, the disputes went to the state court. And we can guess who won in that instance. When the articles were in effect, the states were remarkably independent. Seven different states issued their own currency. It was a tremendous barrier to trade, to commerce. The business of the nation suffered terribly. Um, we didn't have a national currency. The budget, to the extent we had a budget, was expressed in terms of English pounds sterling. It was sort of humiliating. We had beat the British in the revolution and we're still using their money. Um, Any time you traveled, it would be a, a currency negotiation. Wherever you stopped, you might present Pennsylvania money. Well, they wouldn't take Pennsylvania money, so then you'd have to present Portuguese money. Well, maybe they'd take that, but with a 60% discount. It made life very difficult. Um, the states also fought with each other. They argued over their own tax policies. Massachusetts taxed goods from Connecticut at a rate higher than they taxed goods from England. It was bizarre. It was just hostility between the states. Um, they argued over who controlled what land. The land out in the west past the Allegheny, uh, Appalachian Mountains was no state, it was public land. And seven different states claimed parts of that land and they had overlapping claims. Virginia claimed it all. So you ended up with a lot of fighting between the states in a very unsustainable way. Well, according to James Madison, uh, what was going on in the states was essentially injustice, instability, and confusion, as he summarized it in Federalist Number 10. Uh, there were factions that were essentially reigning in many of the states, creditors versus debtors, and so on. And so, for example, in the state of Rhode Island, which was sometimes called Rogue Island, uh, you had a great amount of injustice and no remedy for it. And so things really were politically and economically crumbling. I think we have to remember that it wasn't a guarantee that there would be a United States of America for any given period of time. It was a fledgling nation. Um, and it might have failed and gone the way most republics did all throughout history. In the 1780s, the people who were in favor of a new constitution wanted what they called an energetic government, an energetic national government. And it, in other words, a government that could actually govern. I'll tell you a brief story. George Washington, when he got uh, out of the army, when he surrendered his sword at Annapolis and went back to his fig and vine, had projects that he had been putting off during the Revolution, and perhaps the biggest of those was making the Potomac River navigable. It was an east-west uh, waterway that he thought could be made into a highway that would tie the east coast of the United States together with the interior. In fact, he thought, possibly, we could have taken it all the way back to the Ohio River. Of course, the Appalachian Mountains were in the way, but you know, you could have portage roads. He advanced this scheme so far that he was able to get Virginia and Maryland basically to sign off on it at something called the Mount Vernon Conference in 1785. But the plan went nowhere because under the Articles of Confederation, you needed at least nine states to agree to anything of significance and maybe even unanimity when it came to really major projects it was no way to govern a country. I mean, and a small group of states 
for example, New York, could stop in its tracks uh, a competing canal. And of course, New York was not going to want the Potomac to become the major east-west waterway. They had uh, designs on the Hudson River. We had this economic situation that was crumbling and that was affecting our political situation. Shea's Rebellion militarily is a mere blip. Uh, the, the farmers and tradesmen who rose in arms march on the Springfield Arsenal where all the weapons from the Revolutionary War have been kept and state troops are arrayed against them. They fire a volley over their heads. The rebels don't recede. They fire a volley into them. Three men are killed, the rest run away, and the rebellion's basically over. But it causes Americans to stop and think. It's three years after we've beaten the British, and we're killing each other because we don't know how to run our own government. This is a failure. And this is one that the people who fought for eight years for their independence feel so desperately. This was something that they lived for, to create this new experiment in self-government, and it's in tatters around them.